know, sometimes people ask me, say, do you still bodyguard the Dalai Lama? <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. pushing 72. They have people like half my age that do all that work now. And we're still friends. But... Welcome to the Man of War podcast. My name is Rafa Kandi. And of course, I am a man on a mission here to transform you into a modern day warrior, into a man of action, a man who steps up in the heat of battle, a man who wants to be better father, husband, leader, and visionary. Today's guest is someone that I have, boy, I've been following him for over 40 years of my life. And uh, it was just an honor to have this conversation with him. He is a true ninja. And um, one of those men that you look at and you know, he is, there's so much depth to him, right? A man who has been in the uh, martial arts hall of fame and the black belt hall of fame. And I'm going to read you his bio here, all right? Black belt magazine referred to him as a legend in the martial arts in 2007, called him one of the most influential living martial artists in the world. In 1995, he earned his place in the Black Belt Hall of Fame. Love that. Um, uh, he was awarded the Martial Arts Industry Lifetime Achievement Award in 2015. All right, he trained as a personal student of the Grandmaster of the Ninja in Japan. And this was back in the 1970s and 80s. In 1990s, he served as a personal security escort for the Dalai Lama of Tibet. All right. Obviously, you know who Dalai Lama is. All right. He's a Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner. And uh, of course, he is uh, a man that is uh, very looked up to um, in our world right now. Tremendous influencer, uh, tremendous figure. Um, he is the founder, uh, Stephen is the founder of the martial art called Toshindo, a modern self-protection system based on ancient ninja martial arts principles, which um, are applied to modern threats and pressures. Um, Stephen has also authored 22 books. It's a lot of books. All right. He's a producer of uh, line instructional DVDs and uh, has an internet teaching site. He's also a teacher of the Japanese esoteric meditation tradition. Um, at this point, what I want to say here is this. What I want you to do is grab a piece of paper and a pen, and I want you to jot down uh, this, com you know, elements of this conversation because it's so powerful, really it's so powerful. So with no further ado, I want you to dive into this conversation. Here we go. Stephen Hayes. Welcome to the Man of War podcast, my brother. I got to tell you that it's an honor to have you on. You are someone that I have, I got to tell you, I've looked up to and, and followed your career intently here since I was 13, 14 years old. So I'm just uh, fascinated to have you on. And I think for all our listeners, this is going to be an incredible conversation. First and foremost, Stephen, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Uh, give us a little bit of a, of a guide, you know, around your life and uh, who who you are now and and how you've changed from, say, you know, from the '70s when you started training these the ninja arts, which I love. <laughs> well, I uh, have devoted my whole life to studying the Asian martial arts and uh, also Asian spirituality. Uh, most people don't know so much about the spirituality. I, that's something I did personally, but uh, kind of better known for the martial art. And I got into it as a tiny child. I, back in the fifties, you know, I would observe kids picking on other kids and uh, bullying. And uh, when I was a small child and it didn't seem right, I didn't know how to fight. I didn't know what to do about it, but it, mm. it just, it really bothered me. Uh, and I had heard, I saw TV shows about an Asian martial arts system that you could study that would teach you secrets of how to be uh, more reliable, uh, things that maybe Americans didn't know about in fighting. So I became obsessed with uh, the, Asian martial arts. It wasn't until I was 17 and uh, got enrolled at Miami University of Oxford, Ohio, where I was able to actually start my martial art training. 
And from there, I was uh, on a path uh, that lasted all the way up. Now I'm almost 72. I'm still excited about learning and uh, uh, researching, finding answers to ageless questions. Uh, fortunately, I have a lot of people a lot younger than me that are involved in the quest as well. And uh, uh, I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. I love it. You have a tremendous energy. And like you said, you know, you're, you're almost 72 years old, but you have this fire in you that um, it just shines through in the way you communicate, the way you're smiling right here. And then it's just uh, it's awesome. I love that. You know, there's so much power behind that. So much confidence. The fact that you are still on a quest, um, that you are still searching for answers. You know, we talk about spirituality. That's so deep and such an important part of my life. Um, you know, start, you know, I studied Zen Buddhism for, for many years and uh, but uh, there is a sense, you know, you mentioned something and I, and I want to touch on that. You said it was very personal for you, spirituality. So let's start diving into that before we kind of go back into the martial arts that you trained and all that. Um, it, when you talk about personal, let's dive into that. Well, also, when I was a very small child, I had, uh, oh, strange questions. Uh, strange questions, even a little, little tiny guy. Um, why are we here? What is it to be a human being? Um, where do we go when we're, uh, when this is over, what's the significance of being on planet earth? Um, and those were questions that, uh, really intrigued me. And uh, I asked uh, ministers, uh, the family church we went to, and, uh, you know, and they said, well, these are uh, personal questions that uh, we don't have uh, answers for. It's up to the individual. Well, I, I became even more interested. Then I got involved in the martial arts and... Uh, I was fascinated with the Asian spirituality and in the mid eighties, I finally decided I need to really find out more about this. I need to meet a Tibetan monk. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got on an airplane and went to Kathmandu, Nepal. Isn't that crazy? Wow. Uh, and just like thought I would leave it out there to whatever, whoever I would meet. And, uh, uh, I went there and I did meet a pretty substantial Tibetan monk. And I had these Nepalese guys that drove me around and we went up to the Tibetan border and I actually was able to walk across what the Chinese called the friendship bridge, uh, into Tibet. Uh, the guards were at lunch. Uh, so I went into Tibet and came back and I decided, no, I need to visit Tibet. Mm -hmm. So next year in 1986, it took a long time to arrange a uh, visa and travel, and uh, it's not easy. Went to Tibet uh, in December of 86, came out and asked if I could meet the Dalai Lama. I had no idea what I was talking about, but somehow, I guess maybe because I wrote books, uh, they agreed. And I was able to meet and spend a couple hours with the Dalai Lama. And that weirdly spiraled into other connections. Uh, and uh, back in the States, and, and then he visited the States, and we got connected again. And I ended up being his personal security escort in North America. And so that meant I had access to all the philosophers and teachers and uh, uh, Unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know, you decide, well, we're going to study a little meditation. I think I'll get the Dalai Lama to teach me. <laughs> no, it, it worked. It worked. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't do personal escort work for him anymore. He doesn't travel now with COVID. He's pushing 90. And, you know, sometimes people ask me, say, do you still bodyguard the Dalai Lama? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm pushing 72 they have people like half my age that 
do all that work now. And we're still friends, but uh, I don't do the bodyguard work anymore. But that gave me a whole like mind expanding introduction to uh, something I'd never experienced, never thought about before. And it's you know, the Tibetan Buddhism, and then I found the Japanese, there's a Japanese esoteric Buddhism as well. It was mm -hmm. Very sophisticated, very sophisticated. And uh, so I just got involved in studying uh, that. And still to this day, uh, I'm learning more and studying more and experiencing more and practicing more. Yeah, it's fascinating. So let's, let's take you back now to the seventies, um, you decided to start martial arts training. What was your first martial art initially? Uh, my first martial art was Korean Tang Soo Do. Mm -hmm. uh, this was back in the sixties and I was at Miami university and they had a, a Navy ROTC program. I wasn't in the Navy program, but a lot of these Navy guys um, had been in Vietnam. This was Vietnam was like really going on at that point they'd been in vietnam and some of the older ones that had been in korea and studied this korean martial art and oh man i managed to talk my way into this even though i wasn't in the navy and uh just ate it up just it was mind-blowing uh these things i was learning and uh i used to go to like several classes a day with my university classes and uh, oh my parents were scared to death. I was going to flunk out. Uh, I was such a <laughs> maniac uh, studying this. And I did that for about 10 years until the mid 1970s when uh, I decided to go to Japan and find the headmaster of the ninja. <laughs> yeah, so that, let's take us there. So you decided, I mean, what made you just decide to, to pack up and go to Japan? Were you in search of, of finding uh, uh, you know, the originality of an art or maybe a direct lineage uh, sensei of the art? Or were, did you just go to Japan and say, hey, I'm just going to go out there and, and, and figure it out and find someone to teach me? No, Rafa, it was uh, very much the first part. Uh, when I was in high school, before I even started the martial arts, a friend had given me a copy of this James Bond novel, You Only Live Twice. This was before the movie. I mean, it was the novel was the mm -hmm. only thing you could get. And in this novel, James Bond, who's the protector of the monarch, uh, goes to Japan and is trained by what they called the Togakure and the Iga Ninja. And... Uh, to help, you know, facilitate his disguise and getting into this enemy's place, he's he he marries this beautiful Japanese girl from a mm -hmm. seacoast fishing village on Kyushu Island, the southernmost island. And uh, oh man, for a boring little fifteen-year-old kid from Ohio, this was just painful. It was so cool. Right. Right. And. Uh, Later, Black Belt Magazine, once I got started in the martial arts, Black Belt Magazine had a series of articles by a journalist, Andy Adams, on the ninja and the few people in Japan who were still teaching this ninja martial art. And it involved striking and grappling and choking and locking and swords and staves and throwing blades and... Uh, medical concoctions uh and plus all this mind aspect uh oh to know that that existed and i was on the wrong uh, side of the pacific uh mm -hmm. it was just too much so uh i finally in 1975 bought a ticket to japan and <laughs> wanted to find the this head of the togakure ninja that were described in these black belt magazine articles. Wow. Phenomenal. All right. So you get to Japan and now you're, you're, you're hunting for this individual, uh, finding who this grandmaster is at that time. Um, how did you 
find him and how I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how was your first meeting with him? You know, someone coming from, you know, the United States walking in th through the doors of a, um, of a martial art that has, you know, been around for, for many years, but there's a secrecy right behind this martial art, very secret. Um, so let's talk about that. Well, I got to Japan and I had no idea what to do. You know, I mean, I mm -hmm. couldn't even read a phone book. Uh, I could speak a little Japanese because I'd studied Japanese in college, but that didn't prepare me to, you know, be able to read books. I could be standing in front of the guy's place and see his sign and not even be able to. <laughs> <laughs> I read so somehow in talking to people in train stations i managed to find my way to this little tiny soy sauce brewing town uh northeast of tokyo and uh it was late at night and uh somebody said well i know there's a ryokan a ryokan is like a little inn they don't have hotels in this town so you can maybe stay there. So I found my way to this Ryokan and the little lady that we ran the inn said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I came to study ninjutsu. And she just cracks up, you know, there'd be like a Japanese meeting, a Japanese at a little inn in America and say, well, why are you here? And she yeah. says, oh, I'm here to study with Batman. You know, <laughs> it was just, it was just incredible. Up. And uh, so I said the name, you know, mm -hmm. of this man. And she said, well, he's not a ninja. He's a physical therapist. And I'd read that that's what he did for a living, physical therapist. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, that's the guy. That's the guy. And she says, no, uh, he's not a ninja. She said, I'm his mother's childhood friend. We've known each other since we were children. And he's not a ninja. And I said, so you know him? Oh, yeah, I know him. I know him. So of all the inns I could have stayed at, I found, you know, this one. She called him up. He came over that night. We had an interview and uh, he said, oh, you can study. He brought a couple of guys, young guys about my age. I, I was in my 20s then. So you can study with him tomorrow. And uh, so my, I didn't have to have an interview they didn't make me watch and check me out. No, they just accepted me right away. Oh, I was so honored, you know, that uh, this was uh, facilitated so easily. And uh, so I went to study with them. And the training was brutal. It wasn't anything like my Tang Sudo. Oh, God, joints cranked. And, uh, oh, you know, it was brutal. But the things they knew were just... Uh, I'd never experienced before in my life. So I became even more obsessed with this funny story. Years later, my Japanese wife was talking with one of my fellow trainees. He was a colonel in the Japanese army by then. And she said, oh, yes, Stephen was so honored, you know, to be accepted. And, uh, and he goes, oh, is, is that what he thought happened? And she says, what, what, what? He says, oh, no, no. He said, Stephen, for our generation in Japan, he's a big guy. And we thought we would just try out our techniques on him. He'd be <laughs> fed up after about four days and go away and we could continue training. He just never left. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah, um, so I was lucky I didn't know the truth. Wow, incredible. So you got married in Japan or you got married here in the States? I got married in Japan, okay. 1980. Nice. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's incredible. So now use your training with him. And uh, I guess you made a change at some point to Hatsumi, uh, to, a, to a different teacher of, of the ninja style at some point. Oh, no, that's the guy. I oh, that's find. okay. Got, that's gotcha. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you studied under him for how long? Oh, I lived in Japan until 1980. And then I had a very, you know, amazing visa uh, that let me work and study. Uh, uh, 
but that ran out in 1980. So I'm my wife and I moved back to America, but then I went on a tourist visa fall and spring throughout mm -hmm. the 1980s and into the 1990s. So I would say maybe, oh gosh, 15, 20 years. I actually studied with uh, this guy, uh, Hatsumi. So you basically trained as a Westerner. Were there a lot of Westerners there training with you? No, no, uh, okay. none. It was a tiny little operation, maybe 15 people in the whole world were studying in this little mm -hmm. dojo. And, you know, that was a part of my role. I came back to America and what I'd seen was just unparalleled, unparalleled in American martial arts back in those days. Nowadays, we have mixed martial arts, MMA, where there's grappling and striking and choking. But back in the 70s and 80s, that didn't exist. You either studied judo, which was throwing. You studied aikido, which was capturing energy. You studied karate, which was linear striking. You studied kendo, which was sword, but you didn't mix them up. You didn't mix them up. And uh, so this was an amalgam of all. It was so old. It was before the arts were separated in Japan. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of what I had uh, uh, encountered in the, in the 70s. It was unbelievable, unbelievable. So as a young Westerner studying in Japan, um, ninjutsu, and here you were, uh, I, what was your schedule like? I mean, were you there, you know, training a few hours a day? Did you work or were you just solely committed to being, you know, you know directly, a, you know, a, senpai or some type of you know training student directly under under uh hatsumi oh it's very informal very informal very informal uh, okay which i was surprised at because the tang sudo is very rigid you mm -hmm. know it was supposed to talk by military people so we had to all get in line sure and sure. we would all move our left foot and we would mm -hmm. all move our right hand at the same mm -hmm. time mm -hmm. nothing like that it was very casual uh if something funny happened in the dojo, they'd crack up, you know. Mm. Uh, we never laughed in the Tang Sudo dojo. No laughing in the dojo. <laughs> it was, you know, now looking back, it was kind of funny. But right. uh, so that was my, that was my training experience there. And, uh, uh, and, 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 not all the Japanese guys liked me. Uh, some didn't think the grandmaster should have a, a foreign student. Um, and, uh, and other people did like me. Other people really identified because I, I knew I was there for this short amount of time, so many years. I did as much as I could. So I studied as many places. And if we didn't have training that day in the headmaster's dojo, I'd get together with one of the other guys outside. We'd find a temple yard and, and practice. Uh, I did have a job. I uh, did TV and movie work in Japan. And I mean, I even had an agent and everything. And wow. I have an unusual face for Japan. And so I was a cowboy. I was a cowboy in a Japanese movie. And, I think the one that people maybe would know the most, I was in Shogun, the miniseries. Yes. yes. And uh, that did show up in the U.S. Uh, so I would act and uh, oh, they paid me phenomenally well. And then I would study. And then so my job and then studying. And then the third thing I did was travel around Japan to go to different castles and historical areas that um, were well known for the ninja operating. And this is back before ninja motorcycles and, mm -hmm. you know, ninja turtles and everybody's a ninja now, you know, the of office course, ninja. Of course, of and, course, yeah. uh, but this was way before that. And these places were, were very unknown. Uh, only certain people knew about them. And so I would find them, you know, and go visit so what was it about the ninja and, you know, going to Japan and you searching for these places that really, I mean, apparently you had tremendous passion for it. 
uh, what were, you know, you were in a search, what were you searching for? Oh, um, all the secrets that I had been chasing ever since I was a child. Um, uh, I was convinced there, there were, there was knowledge uh, and that's sort of even tied into my spiritual quest as well, because the ninja were associated with these people called Yamabushi, uh, mountain ascetics, or uh, Shugenja is another word for them. And so there were understandings of how the world worked. So, for instance, uh, they would refer to five elements, earth, water, fire, wind, and void. And uh, what's that mean? What's that mean? Interestingly, a lot of the guys in the dojo didn't have a clue. It is so integral to Japanese spirituality that nobody pays attention to it anymore. I mean, if that makes sense, you know. Uh, oh, that's like my grandmother's religion. Don't worry about that. I'm not worried about it. I want to learn what the significance is. And so that. I began to study this. I even went to temples and studied with monks and uh, put together the idea that each of these elements represents a part of our emotional and physical makeup. Um, the uh, earth element stands for uh, resolute in a fight. It's the kind of person who just holds ground and gets hit and just repels and pounds back. Uh, water, on the other hand, is one who takes what's coming in, whoop, slips, angles to the side, and now there's a new vulnerability in the attacker. And uh, I was the only one who knew this. I couldn't believe it. I was the only one who knew this. And the Japanese are not interested in studying this. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I can't explain that to this day. So the uh, the ninja arts are considered very esoteric, almost magical to you know to the Western world at times, where you see ninjas disappear and throw you know the the, the dust and the ninja stars, the shuriken, and the, so I want to dive a little bit into this. All right, are there secrets that are kept within the ninja within uh, the lineage of ninjutsu? Or is it more, a, a, you know, the, a tale of the West creating the, these things? Um, you know, for, for us, as I guess, here in the West, you know, we've always looked at the ninja, you know, as these assassins, right? These uh, men that had not only physical skills, but they were very spiritual, spiritual and they were connected in a way that was very different than every other martial art. Uh, hence, you know, magic. Hence, these incredible feats that they were able to accomplish. So um, my question here basically is, did they have, I mean, or are they, do they still have these secrets that are kept that maybe that you hold close to your chest? Well, actually, that's a, that question goes into so many directions. Um, yeah, there are secrets, but the secrets are from the 1500s. So one of the secrets was how you mix black powder. Uh, nobody needs to know how to mix black powder today. You can, you know, buy it in a hunting store. Uh, and there are even better alternatives to black powder now. But that was a secret. You had to go to the outhouse and find urea in the soil and mix it with charcoal. Nobody needs that. Maybe there's a certain form of black powder that creates smoke. And so there's a formula that involves sulfur and so forth. You just buy a smoke bomb. Uh, you can buy these things today. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, health, the shuriken was a steel plate that was allowed to rust. And it was thrown as a distraction. You know, movies, they show a shuriken go halfway through somebody's skull and they die. But in reality, it was a distraction. It would cut and fly away, and the swordsman would have no idea what it was. Yeah, but a couple of days later, he gets tetanus in the lockjaw and dies, and there's nothing you can do about it. Oh, now you get a tetanus shot. 
Uh, it's so easy. So a lot of these secrets are kind of museum pieces at this point. Um, the secrets I'm interested in are the internal secrets. How do we change our mind about what's going on? How do we, uh, if we're focused on a problem, how do we get over here where we can see the problem in a different light? Um, how do I trap myself through my own beliefs or my own emotions, uh, trap myself in this little narrow passageway? Uh, well, no, I could easily be over here. I could easily be over there. Um, uh, that's really what's fascinating to me at this point. And, and with our culture, uh, our culture has become very, I, I think, very polarized. People are so angry, so angry. I was speaking to a friend of mine in Japan last night on a uh, 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 Skype call. And he said, you know, yeah, it seems everybody in America is so angry with each other. Uh, there's just no room for discussion anymore. Uh, and I, I find that to be very true. Uh, how do we just settle things down? How do we bring a little humor into it or a little humanity into it? Uh, these are the kind of secrets that are still taught. It, you can find them if you're uh, deep enough and intelligent enough. You can find them hidden in the lore that we practice in the dojo. All right, so let's bring you fast forward now. You're, um, you've, uh, you know, you're achieved a very high rank in ninjutsu. I think you. What is your rank in, in ninjutsu? Oh, years ago, I was given a, a tenth don. So that's pretty much the highest you can go. Yeah, yeah. I don't even claim that anymore. Uh, my wife and I started a kind of a new western martial art we took the principles mm -hmm. from this ancient ninja martial art uh and we adapted them to you know more modern scenarios and so let's talk we, about that Let, let's dive into that because that's fascinating so so when did this transition when did you start you know changing that uh, you know the way that you uh, that taught I'm, I'm assuming you taught ninjutsu the way that it was taught to you for a while right yeah and, yeah and when did you start making that turn and started bringing in you know your own uh philosophies i guess your your, your own strategies into some of this and, and and pulling from the ninjutsu style and kind of making it more of a of a western style so let's talk about that yeah that started in the mid 1990s okay uh and so I took a lot of these, you know, what we call spiritual or mental way of thinking, way of uh, relating mm -hmm. uh, and adapted those things and made it part of the program. I replay, I put it back in there. Uh, people can study how they trick themselves, how they trap themselves. Uh, I put that back in. Uh, the physical techniques, uh, we changed the way the attackers attacked because people fought differently in 1500s Japan than they do in 2020s in America. So we, we allow people to imitate the problem they're going to have today rather than a historical uh, kind of approach uh, that they were teaching in Japan. And uh, so it was quite an ordeal. It was quite an ordeal. We had to keep, I felt, I needed to keep very connected to the principles of the ninja martial art. It's not something I just made up. Um, we shifted them over uh, and allowed those to take on a new form uh, that was more encouraging. Two differences. One, right away, we got a lot more women a lot more women hmm. and uh, because of the pragma, the pragmatic approach. And also maybe my wife, she's a small Japanese person. So she moves a little differently than I do. And uh, there's a, there's proper, we call it Toshindo. Toshindo is the name of this martial art. There's proper Toshindo movement, but there's room for adaptation for the individual. And uh, the women liked it. 
it was uh, uh, it made a lot of sense to women. And uh, the other thing is that uh, you know the ninja martial art. You know, there were there were these awful movies that were made in the 1980s, and ninja were seen as assassins and spooky guys, and that's not really historically accurate. That's something they made up for the movies, um, and uh, so our approach was so honest and real that it encouraged a little more balanced individual we had some unbalanced people who wanted to study i want to be a ninja you know and uh so that's something we're we're still kind of fighting that you know some people don't believe ninja uh uh everybody uses that word now no there's a real martial art uh of the ninja all right, so uh, here, here you are. You, you've you've kind of taught your new art, Toshindo. You said it's the name of it, okay. Um, and what did you see that you needed to change uh, to be more pragmatic? All right, like you were talking before the podcast started, uh, you mentioned something about a lot of the attacks are gang related, multiple attacker um, attacks. Uh, coming from a perspective of being a lifelong martial artist, almost 40 years, um, having black belts in judo and Aikido and uh, Japanese jiu-jitsu. And one of the most important things for me is be able to adapt um, to, to now, to the reality of being now as a police officer and, and, and teaching in the police academy uh, from the defensive tactics side. Uh, you need to have things that are applicable, things that are for the most part, if you're teaching in a short term, you know, have to be understandable to the other side, things that people can, can, can grasp rather easily so they can deploy it when, when, uh, uh, when the, uh, shit hits the fan in other words. But hmm. my question to you here is, um, from a perspective of the now, the today, okay. How have you seen the martial arts change with MMA, with, you know, uh, the, uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu wrestling and different types of you know boxing and sa savate which is fr fr French and then you add you know your um, your spice to this I'm curious to see what you know what did you bring to the table and how did you create this for today's world well you know as a trainer of police you have to also take into consideration Okay, what's this guy going to do? Uh, I have a limited time. I've got to train him. And you also have to train him to move within the law. And, you know, different areas have like differing laws. Uh, this is how we handcuff. Okay, we handcuff people this way. Well, then somebody chokes. Oh, we have to change the way we handcuff people now. Uh, uh, you're allowed to choke them out. No, you were not allowed to choke. Uh, there's constant revision of the law. So as a police trainer, you've got to be up on that. And sometimes it's counterintuitive. Uh, you're not allowed to do the one thing that is going to, uh, you know, save your, your neck. 100%. Hmm. Similar, similar to civilian defense. Now we are teaching personal self-defense. This isn't a martial art that's mm -hmm. abstract uh, that people can study. Uh, um, I dedicated myself to real self-defense. So a large part of what we have to teach is how do you keep from going to jail? I mean, sometimes I'll ask a crowd, we'll say, how many of you have read a news story where the defender is actually punished more severely then the criminal and hands go up. Um, some guy starts a fight. Uh, we're scared to death. We don't know how far this guy's going to go. We're trying to get out of there. He moves. We elbow him in the head. He stumbles and falls and hits his head uh, on the curb and dies. We go to jail. Sure. Nobody looks and says, no, this guy's got a record. He's a, he's just a, worthless being, uh, uh, nope, 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 we go to jail. 
we go to jail and that needs to be, you know, acknowledged. Uh, that needs to be a part of the training. What are the conditions that warrant self-defense? Uh, some areas you have to prove to the prosecution that what you did was actually self-defense. You are presumed guilty. I mean, that's the way it is. Now in Ohio, they recently changed that to where the prosecution has to prove that what you did was not self-defense, but it's very complex, very complex. And so what you see in a movie where some guy, you know, just smacks around a criminal and no, 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 it's not that straightforward. It is very complex. And I don't want to get political here, but I believe that the powers that rule us uh, are not happy when we, we take responsibility for our own lives. Uh, we are punished. So right away, that had to come in. Because what I studied in Japan, you know, somebody's at a distance, you knock away a kick, they come in, you trap a limb, they come in closer, you choke them out, you take them to the ground and, and how you kill them. Yep. that can't be self-defense that's not legally justified so that was one serious change today you can see it on youtube videos you know everybody uh you know takes a video of some problem they don't help the victim they just take videos and uh but so you see them all the time on youtube four, five, six guys ganging up on one person. And that's cool. So in the 70s and 80s, it's not considered cowardly anymore. It's just the way the young ones do it. Young gangs do it. They'll, and so if you're in a, a bystander, how are you going to take on five people to help one guy getting beat up? Uh, very frustrating. Uh, so you need a different kind of mindset as to what can happen. So that was a big change. Uh, second change in terms of how we're uh, dealing with things and so forth. And then the third change that I brought in with the, the teachings, you know, um, I guess I could say this, a lot of it is Buddhism but without the B, without the B word, you know, I mean, we're America, people are Christian or they're atheist, uh, not too many Buddhists, but the wonderful thing about Buddhism is you don't have to believe in any of this stuff and it works. It's a, it's a mind training, mind exploring system. It's not a, a system of reverence and worship. So you could be a Christian and, and do Buddhist things. You could be an atheist and do Buddhist things. You yes. could be Jewish. Uh, so we take a lot of the teachings and put that in the training as well. How do I deal with these situations? Uh, and a lot of our people are good people. They're good people. They're not thugs. They're not fighters. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you take a good person who's just shocked and horrified at something and that's what the bad guy's going to count on is that you're not going to flee or fight. You're going to freeze just for that moment. And then the fight's over in seconds, how to know what's going on in the mind and change your breathing and change your posture a little bit uh, to be able to fit into this situation. So those are like three major changes that we had to make to allow this to fit into 2020s uh, America. When you were uh, protecting the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama, and uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Were you? Did you ever have to really um, use your martial skills? Did you take some of that and you embedded it into your training system? Uh, maybe you started to see some of the the, the weaknesses and and, and um, what you had studied before. And maybe talk to me a little bit about your experience uh, protecting uh, the Dalai Lama. Yeah, I mean, we had, I had a whole team of people and then I would a liaison with the local, like the badge and gun people in the local area. So my job was to, to get him to safety, the badge and gun people, they were going to deal with the bad guys. 
And uh, so there were only a handful of times when I had to physically do something. Yeah, but I mean, I'm the bodyguard of this beacon of compassion. Uh, you know, I can't like go out in sunglasses and pound this guy into submission. I had to use very clever ways of getting this person over to where the cops were. And so I could get the Dalai Lama out of the way. Uh, didn't look anything like an MMA match or a Brazilian mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu match. You know, I think that's one of the things that, you know, may be interesting to people. Uh, the mindset of an MMA fighter or a Brazilian jiu-jitsu where there is competition. There's no competition in ninjutsu. Um, it's asymmetrical training. That means an attacker is coming in and we're defending against this. It's not like symmetrical training where two trained athletes agree, you know, we're both going to do this fight. And then, uh, yeah, and we're going to follow the rules. And so we get in the ring and we follow the rules and whoever's the stronger, faster, you know, more resistant to uh, damage uh, and maybe a little spirit in there wins the fight. Uh, it's so different on the street. Uh, so, you know, my take is how much time do you spend in the training hall dealing with multiple people as opposed to one guy? Uh, and a lot of martial arts are still, I say, still riding them bareback, you know, uh, <laughs> doing the old, uh, <laughs> right. the old paradigm and, uh, and people are woefully unprepared for what they're going to actually run into with, uh, you know, street hassling, street threatening, street violence, uh, or let alone something like a carjacking or a home invasion. I don't think a lot of martial arts are designed to prepare people for that. So when you're teaching your, the components, the philosophy behind what you're teaching now is um, it's more about being completely aware that there may be multiple attackers when you are attacked in a hyper-violent situation, uh, being ready for not just, you know, uh, not just one attacker, but the possibility of that second or third. I do agree with you that most martial arts, even now, are still focused on that one-to-one -one battle. And um, I think there is a, there's a lot of downfall and even some of these newer MMA arts that they're constantly uh, focused on that one-to-one. -one. Uh, through some of my training and experience where I have conducted courses, uh, and the second that you throw in that second person or that third person, and if they're armed, even worse, mm -hmm. there's a complete discombobble of the mind. Um, for a lot of guys that are you know, ground guys that love to, you know, grappling is great, but you have to be very careful, you know, when you uh, are going against multiple attackers um, and so on. So I want to know your philosophy on going against multiple attackers. And, and if that's what you're teaching. Well, you know, I, what you mentioned is so true. You know, I mean, it's fascinating what these Brazilian jujitsu people can do on the ground and, but Staying on the ground is the last thing I would want to do in a self-defense situation. I did, I did see a YouTube video. I don't believe it was set up. I believe it was, was real. And these two, I don't know, young teenagers got in a fight. And this one kid just swamps the other, takes him to the ground. He's getting him locked up. And this kid's screaming <laughs> and from the side of the video. The defeated kid's mom walks up and kicks this other kid right in the head boom knocks him mm -hmm. out he flips off she grabs her kid and gets out of there somebody's mom right you know uh you get somebody who's committed to violence obviously uh if i'm wiggling around on the ground on some guy i am uh, in a world of hurt so number one is maintain our footing or get back to footing as we're getting back to footing, get away from a guy where I can get my balance here. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing is instead of facing somebody this way with my, you know, my 
chest all exposed like this. Um, we maintain a sideways position. So all they see are these bony points. Uh, so this is a very different, you know, approach from a uh, grappler MMA guy. Um, and uh, the other thing that happens in MMA is, you know, pretty much people will throw maybe three things. And if something hasn't worked by then, they'll back off and circle around. I mean, that just seems to be a part of the training. Whereas on the street, no, it's not three things and the guy backs off. He'll throw seven or eight. Uh, he'll throw three or four knees that don't make a connection to their target in the right way. Well, the fifth one does. Um, so that's kind of this, what I call asymmetrical. If you get somebody who's doubting themselves or unsure what to do, oh, he's the best victim because the one who's angry with life, angry with other people who are prettier and smarter and richer. And he's just, he wants them to feel as bad about being alive as he does. And he didn't, he's not in it to win a fight. He's in it to administer a beating. Uh, and uh, so if you show some determination, some skill, a little bit of knowledge uh, where he knows this is going to be a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. It's not like in the movies where, you know, two tough guys square up and uh, they sort of respect each other, but hate each other. That's bull crap. That's movie crap. Um, uh, guy's not going to fight if he thinks he's already defeated, even if they're like two of them, he'll make some room he'll 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 keep his feet back and he'll lean in with his face and say something but you know he can get out of there real fast he doesn't right 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 move forward um he'll call you every obscene name in the book and you know wiggle around and as, as he's leaving you know uh and uh hey what can i say it encourages him just to keep going, just keep going. I don't want to go to jail. Uh, I don't want to give away a free private lesson. <laughs> uh, you know, this guy thinks he won. Right. Hey, my life is beautiful. I live in a gorgeous home. I have wonderful friends. I have like the perfect daughters and granddaughters. I'm married to my dream girl. I drive my dream cars. I have a beautiful awesome. life. So when I run into some right. tragic loser, give the poor guy a break. You know? Right. right. <laughs> That's a good mentality. A oh man. That's a good You're mentality. too tough for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to just get in my truck and take off. Uh, yeah. Is that okay? You know, and uh, I, but you got to say it from down here, you know, down in the gut. Right. Yeah. He might get, uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> You know, say, oh, man, hey, I apologize. I apologize. You're the third guy today that I've just hacked off. Uh, this is just not my day. Excuse me. I'm going to get in my truck and take off. And uh, you have a great day. Uh, he's calling me a wussy. I mean, all these names. Th that's fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. You forgot. You, sh you should have mentioned I was bald. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, yeah, but you have to say it from way down here. And maybe if he's a little smart, he understands. Uh, this guy's giving me a break here. This guy's giving me a break. Um, and maybe he's stupid and he doesn't get it. But poor loser, you know, let him go. Let him go. Give him a break. That's now, awesome. that's, that's my attitude. And not everybody agrees with me. Not everybody agrees with me. It's might as well, Stephen Hayes, he, you know, he's old. He's used up. He has to talk his way out we fight and we, you know, you run into stupid people that had mm -hmm. had childhoods or something. And they're still working through this crap. I don't know. Uh, they don't stick around me. Um, uh, anyway, that, that's, that's kind of my philosophy. Yeah, yeah man, that, that, that's great. And, and what I love about it is th that's real. I mean, that, that is what you just said is, is, is very real. So I want to jump into the mentality, right? I want to jump into the mindset of our day and age right now. All right. Well, we see weak mindedness all over the place, right? We, we see it everywhere you go. Okay. The media is portraying 
uh, you know, they're almost to the point where everything you, everywhere you look, you know, they just want to have sheep out there. You know, they want basically the herd mentality, people to follow whatever they say. Um, so I want to connect the dots here with the mentality and spirituality. You know, we talk about the body, the mind, and the spirit. Okay. Um, in our day and age, what I find, especially out there, is that people don't understand mental, you know, men, men, mentality. They, they kind of get it confused. What is your approach to living a life that embodies this warrior spirit every single day where you're, you know, you're sharp in mind, you're sharp in body, you're definitely sharp in spirit because you got a lot of energy. I mean, you look like you're in great shape. You're focused. Um, and I love that. I love to see that. I mean, how do you live your life? Give us a, a little bit of an insight into your daily routine. And, you know, I love to go into that. Oh, uh, kind of boring. <laughs> kind of boring. Yeah. Um, I think the most important thing to comment on that is that, uh, you know, I'm always looking for something a little different, something new, something that's going to actually kind of back me up a little bit. I have to explore this and learn. I love it when people will point out things that I'm doing uh, not so effective. It could be a little more effective this way. Uh, even if they're wrong, I stop and think, well, okay, let's check this out. Uh, what if they're right? What evidence is there? Sometimes there's not evidence. This person is just emotionally spouting off or something. Uh, oh, there could be evidence there. Uh, I could change. So every day, if I could change a little bit every day, that uh, is, uh, you know, something really exciting for me. So that's one significant part of the day. You know, when you take a guy only almost 72, a lot of my uh, high school friends, you know, I still see them sometimes. They're kind of set in their ways <laughs> by 72. Ah, this is what I believe. And this is, this is well, you know, you're not current. Yeah. Uh, how are you changing? How are you growing? So I think that's maybe the most important part. Um, I try to do different uh, things, get around people who think different from me. Uh, now, the one thing that I can do with that is I'm from the old days. I was born in the 1940s. I remember the 1950s when you could be a, sitting across from somebody who's diametrically opposed to everything you say, oh, and you hear it and you go, oh, well, here's what I believe. And, you know, uh, uh, young ones today, no, they can't do that. They can't do that. Uh, I believe that, uh, you know, this is one of the culprits. Um, media finds that if they can keep us on edge fighting each other, we're going to turn to that media more frequently. You know, so if I think something's bad's going on, the first thing I do when I get up in the morning is I got to go online and find out what's going on. Uh, I often say, uh, you know, good news is nice. Good news is nice. Bad news is important. And the media constantly has us, you know, at war with each other and, uh, and we don't get it. You know, we fall into these camps. Uh, the other thing too is, you know, this is now given the average person a voice. So back in the fifties, there were a few, you know, influencers, we call them now influencers. There were a few influencers, but everybody had an opinion, you know, so old uncle Ted would go to the bar and sit there with his buddies and he'd talk about politics and religion and the economy. And some people agree with him, some wouldn't. And aunt Minnie would go play cards and she'd talk about her beliefs, but it was a tiny little, tiny little, uh, influence there. Now, nobody's, nobody's have a world voice and mega celebrities. This is amazing to me. Mega celebrities, vastly wealthy. They live in palaces. They work four and a half weeks a year doing a movie. Uh, uh, 
they have people waiting in a line to fall in love with them. They drive, you know, rip snorter supercars and they'll get into arguments with nobodies on Twitter. And, you know, so, you know, and then the, the audience writes, oh boy, wasn't she wonderful? She clapped back at this, this nobody who says, oh, I think she's fat, you know, or I think she's stupid. Uh, the media knows how to build those animosities and fights. And then the people don't understand what's going on. And uh, um, I sound like a conspiracy nut here, but <laughs> uh, I really believe that there is a conspiracy to keep fighting and angry with each other. Uh, and once one problem goes away, they're going to find another problem to introduce to us, to keep us uh, at each other. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you, Stephen. I, I do. I really do. Mm. Now, listen, you've written so many books, man. Uh, I mean, uh, I've read probably about half a dozen of them. Um, you go into, I mean, your books for, for our listeners here, you got to look him up. A lot of his books are from O'Hara, right? From, and also, um, I mean, I, there are too many to name. I mean, you got about what? 15, 15 books or so that you've written? 22. 22. 22. Look at that. So um, great. Yeah. I mean, people can just look on the internet, mm -hmm. like go to Amazon and put in Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, S-T-E-P-H-E-N. Which, which is your latest book? Hmm? Which is your latest book? Uh, it's called The Ninja Defense. Got it. It's from Tuttle in Japan, The Ninja Defense. And it's kind of an intermediate book, but it has a lot of strategies mm -hmm. for how to fit into today's world. Some of these verbal lines are, are in there, uh, different ways of looking at conflict. You know, because I think that's one of the things that can bother a person, you know, uh, they can feel invade you know, like you're driving along and somebody stops and lets you sneak into traffic and get across where you're going. Oh, that's nice. You wave and you remember it for a couple of minutes and then you forget it. Somebody pulls their car up and gives you the finger. Uh, you, you remember that for like two days. Yeah. I should have done this. I, it, whoa, whoa, whoa. Right. He's, yeah. a, he's a nitwit. He's a nitwit. He's got half a brain. Uh, life has just been crappy to him. Uh, that's that's all he knows. That's all he knows. Uh, give the poor idiot a break. But you have to be clean in yourself to where you don't feel like that guy won. That guy won. And uh, so these mind processes, uh, you know, that I attribute back to the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, that he taught me, I mean, he was so patient, incredibly patient. You know, we'd be waiting for him to go on stage and we'd be around the green room. And in the beginning, I asked him a lot of questions and he would answer in real everyday terms. Mm -hmm. He speaks excellent English, speaks excellent English. And uh, <laughs> now I look back, some of the questions, I'm kind of embarrassed, you know, but I didn't know, I didn't know. And so I would ask him and he would tell me, and sometimes he would refer me to some of his staff and they would fill me in. And, uh, but that was an important part, how to stay clean, how to stay okay. Uh, I imagine you ran into that. You have to in police training, you know, God, people throwing water on police now and calling them all kinds, you know, Oh, yeah. horrible names. And, uh, you know, you can't just club somebody for calling you, uh, you know, son of a gun or something like that, uh, that's got to be in police training. How do you position yourself mentally to be above these little characters and not take it personally? Uh, when I get even with them, I take it personally. How to be above this? You're above the fight. You're trying to just make there be peace, peace officer, I'm trying to make there be peace here. Um, yeah, without a doubt, it's a, that that is a, a difficult component. I mean, it is probably one of the most difficult elements that a police officer nowadays has to go through. Uh, but your philosophy is excellent. How long have you held this philosophy? Was that something that you 
learn from ninjutsu? Was it something that you learned from the Dalai Lama? Did, it, did you make a transition in your life at some point where you started to say, you know what, I just have to chill. You know, I have to take, you know, perceive, like we talked about earlier, you know, the way you perceive something, it, it's, it's what you make it in the end. So the question then is, when did you make this transition? Was this something in, in your 20s, 30s, 40s? Or because uh, we're talking to right now a uh, generation that most of the time, the second that you say anything that's going to disturb them, as, as you stated earlier, they flip out. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. You know, they flip out. So to have this type of control that you have, um, when did you get to that? I mean, what, what, at what point during your life did you feel like you made that transition? Uh, mid eighties when I met the Dalai Lama, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of influence in you. Oh yeah. Tremendous amount of influence. I mean, this guy was born to rule Tibet and China came in there with tanks and howitzers and they were brutal. Mm -hmm. They were brutal, you know, it's like the beginning of the Chinese communist thing. And, oh man, these, you take a bunch of poor, uneducated, downtrodden. And I, mean, I mean, there was a legitimate imbalance in China. They're very powerful and wealthy. And then this sea of just human things that they used up and the human things rebelled and they got rid of the aristocracy so they were angry they were angry and they were in uniforms that didn't fit and they had to eat food that they didn't like and they had to go to tibet where they they weren't from there so these soldiers were brutal and uh looking at what the dalai lama had to go through made any of my problems seem almost embarrassing you know embarrassing sure. Sure. uh you know, he really taught me a lot. In fact, one time I remember asking him, uh, you know, you are always so calm and composed, you know, and humorous. Doesn't it ever like really get you angry what the Chinese did to your mm -hmm. country back in the 50s? And he said, well, I lost my country. I lost my people. Um, the Chinese took everything. They took everything, but the one thing they couldn't get was my peace of mind and happiness. And sure. uh, I'm not going to give that up. Uh, now, what he was saying is for him to be angry and uh, uh, unpeace of mind, mm -hmm. it's not going to help, you know. But could you see how a person in his position might have been that way to justify not being in Tibet? Uh, oh, for sure. Oh, I, I'm going to get angry with them, so nobody gets angry with me. But no, no, he, for sure. Uh, he says, no, I'm, I'm happy, and that really affected me. Along with the understanding, the physical techniques of this ninja martial art, very different from uh, what you might see in uh, jujitsu or uh, MMA. Uh, the strategy assumes that you are lower in power and outnumbered and it just kind of here's how you deal with that oh as opposed to no i'm the champion of the world and here's a champion challenger and, oh that's a whole different thing you'd have to go to a different martial art to learn that we, we don't teach that hmm. phenomenal love it do you still meditate is it something that you you sit, you breathe, you have a, a plan of that? I mean, I imagine you do. So I'm going to ask you a question directly because I got you're so calm and so just the way that there's, there's a sense about you. There's a um, a command presence uh, about you, and when you speak, you speak from the heart. And uh, I don't say that uh, to everybody. Believe me. <laughs> yeah, I have meditation practices that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, still getting better every day, getting a little better. Awesome. Awesome. Steven, man, it's been an honor to have you on. Um, where can people uh, follow you um, on Instagram and on, uh, you're on Instagram and where else are you at? Oh, um, you know, I guess there's uh, Facebook. If you just put in Stephen K. Hayes, I think I'm like 60 thousand followers on facebook okay. um 
and uh, Stephen K. Hayes, I think is what you put in on Facebook and okay. little pictures of Stephen K. Hayes will come up and, you know, you can recognize my August appearance and uh, click on that one. And uh, mm -hmm. there is a Stephen K. Hayes dot com. That's like it's all one word. S-T-E-P-H-E-N-K-H-A-Y-E-S. That's your website. Yeah. Stephen K. Hayes dot com. And we're like in the process of upgrading that. Uh, okay. And uh, there's not- Now, is there a program that you have either online or something that you that you share with with uh, others that want to train your, your system and, and your philosophies? I do, I do. Um, that is Ninja Life, N-I-N-J-A-L-I-F-E, like it's one word, Ninja Life dot okay. TV ninjalife.tv and that's a subscription service people can i mean we take them through the basics uh through some advanced things uh, my wife teaches some of this ninja yoga on there uh cool. i have a, another friend who teaches some his versions of some of these meditations uh, excellent <clears throat> yeah, excellent ninja life tv good i see it very nice awesome very good all right so listen i'll have all these links on our show notes um, and I definitely, uh, for you guys, that this is the first time that you hear about Stephen Hayes. Look, I don't have to tell you, but he's been in a bunch of different movies um, and he's written 22 books. Go out there, read up because there's some very, very powerful books here, at least the ones that I've read and uh, all the other reviews that I've seen in his books have been straightforward. The fact that you are, do you, are you still planning to, to release a new books? Are you still in the process of writing or, or? Yeah, you know, I've written 22. So uh, what do I have left to say? <laughs> so I run into new adventures and uh, new I things. Guess. So I, I imagine I'll continue to write books. Yeah. All right, Stephen, thank you so much for being on again. It's been an honor. Um, and certainly uh, for those uh, follow this guy, he is legit squared away. Um, he's really an inspiration. Thank you very much for being on. What a great conversation. All right. Very powerful, very meaningful. Take these elements, these components and start integrating them into your life. You'll be changed without a doubt. Listen, give us a follow on uh, Instagram at man of war with two R's also um, on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash man of war. Um, if you can just turn on that notification bell and uh, of course, uh, give us a subscribe also, we're on Facebook at The Real Man of War. All right, my brothers, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for all of your support. Until next time, your life may be full of danger, but never retreat. Your last battle may be your greatest victory.